Mm -hmm. I, it's, um, it is exactly, it's something simple. Um, you know, so like people spend an inordinate amount of time making these like little short attention span, 15, 20 minute videos. They dump hundreds of hours making these, you know, really, really high production quality math content videos and more power to them, but um, like that's not what I do. I just take a camera to class, put it on, and you know, whatever happens, happens. And um, it's both good and bad, you know. The, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, but I've been doing this for like five years, and I pretty much tape most of my classes, except for this one, because I haven't said much in here. <laughs> um, and I think there may also be copyright issues in here more so, but not, this is my brother's, right, so whatever. Yeah. But it'd be an issue if you posted this on a social media or just on the internet where anyone could find it. Ah. Because that's where you get into I see. I have to pay for the rights to his friends if I'm just gonna read it with a bunch of people in my living room. Right. Like I'm not selling tickets if this like I don't have to pay for the rights for it. But if I did record it mm -hmm. and post it on YouTube, I'm in trouble. <laughs> ah. Yeah. So well, I'm not a lawyer, but um, so anyway, we just opened up the exercise set four, and um, we just opened up my brother's wonderful website, Bill Cook Math. What a very imaginative name that was. Um, his name is George. No, it's, it's Bill. Anyway, um, and so I think his tangent interaction we we're just looking at is pretty cool. So take a picture of it, you know, and, and just put it there, show that you've played with it a little bit. And then I, I wanted to look at the new, Newton's method because I mean, we, we did Newton's method in here using Excel, and I think that was a good exercise. Like that kind of iterative Excel programming is a useful skill outside of teaching. I mean, that's just something useful to know about. Um, but this, this little thing here is, it's actually pretty cool. Um, you know, he's got a little derivation here at the top of Newton's method, like we went through the other day, right? And um, I like his, uh, he's actually graphed, right? He actually has pictures, if you will. He's plotted the tangent lines and the zeros of the tangent lines. So you can actually see Newton's method in this little sage interaction that Bill made, which is pretty cool if I can zoom in on that. Zoom. Let's see if we can, uh, I'm going to try to change the function up a little bit here and see what happens. I turn off the light here, but it might help the video some. That's eh, a little bit better. So we're at billcookmath.com slash sage slash calculus slash Newton's method at HTML. Right now we're looking at x squared, and this is just Newton's method to, uh, you know, five steps. Here's 16 steps. <laughs> you can't hardly tell the difference, right? Because by the time the first couple steps, it's already so s stupidly close to, uh, you know, the answer. What if I start, if I make the initial guess 30, that would be dumb. Let's do it. So, um, so apparently he's got the plot set. So it will plot the guesses, but it won't adjust. It won't plot. This plot domain will make the. Let me maybe make that go out a little bit more. Oops. I like that he's put this little plot window down here. It's kind of nice, right? So there you go. That gives you a better sense of it. This controls how far you can see the function. And then 
you know, that's the initial guess, the first, the initial guess, the first guess, um, second guess, third guess, fourth guess, d d d zooming into the zero, of course. But I think he had some other built-in demos that were pretty snazzy. Like this x squared sine x is pretty, pretty cool. Take this thing out, yeah? So x, x squared sine x is a funny function. You can see it. <laughs> I think we, man, what happened there? Look at that one. <laughs> What's, what, what? I don't know, I don't know what exactly happened there. <laughs> Oh, when, let's, let's animate it. Uh, it's it's thinking. So it's 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 showing you. I think it's guess. It's like guess, 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 guess. It, it's okay. I mean, I didn't make it. I can't criticize it, but it, it's okay. I don't know. I'm, I'm never, I'm rarely happy with animations in math. Uh, yeah, it's kind of cool. He's, he's got one that'll make it fail. I'm trying to remember which one that was. Oh, check this out. So, like, think about this. This is something we didn't talk about in the Newton's method lab, but we really should have. What happens if there is no zero? Like, x squared plus a half. That one, yeah, so that one's, that one is just going to keep going and going, right? Because there is no zero. So it makes total sense that it's just going to keep going. There's no, there is no answer to converge to in this case. So it's kind of cool. All right, I think that's enough playing. Explore, take, so what's that? Take a screen. Take a screen grab of whatever you think is neat from that, and then we'll move along here. Don't worry. One of the later things will take us a bunch of time. You're like, well, thank you. I was worried we were going to get out early. That would offend me deeply. Um, so, you guys cover Taylor polynomials in like calculus too, is that right? Like do series, series approximations of functions in calculus too? Do you remember? Don't remember calculus too? Oh, so, um, so calculus too. Um, or, or, well, whenever you talk about Taylor polynomials, we all know tangent line is the best linear approximation to a function, right? Mm -hmm. So a Taylor polynomial is sort of the best polynomial approximation to the function, and you build the Taylor polynomial from looking at the derivative, the second derivative, third derivative, however many you like. So like the quadratic, you need to know the value of the function, the derivative, and the second derivative at a point to construct the Taylor polynomial second order. The third order requires, you know, up to the third derivative and so forth. And um, so this is a very nice demo here because you can actually kind of see it. Um, well, this one's a, this, he's, his, his demo that we have right now, it's on the cubic, right? So this one's kind of funny because, um, let, me, let me take n back down to 2 for a second here. So the original function is in blue, right? And so... We're, at, we're centering the uh, Taylor polynomial at minus 2. So what's the best zeroth order approximation to the function? It's very stupid. You just say function equal to whatever the value of the function is at minus 2. So like 19, apparently. Y equal, to, y equal to 19 is the first approximation, the zeroth approximation to the function at the point. So like take this curvy function, replace it with just a constant. You know, We do that in physics. You do that, most of your like, first course in physics, you say f is equal to mg. f isn't equal to mg, f is like, g is equal to gmm over r squared, where it's mass of the earth, mass of the uh, person that's being gravitated on, and r is the distance between the center of the earth and where you are. But we just say, 
mg. Right, we replace that like nonlinear function of gravity with just a constant. So like we actually use that zeroth order approximation for interesting stuff. A lot of your physics course is that. But then the best linear approximation, well, that's the tangent line. You can see that right here, right? See that guy? Again, the blue is the actual function, the cubic. See where now what's this this magenta one? Well, that's the best quadratic approximation at that point right there. And something really neat happens if you look at what happens with n equals 3. Where is n equals 3? Can you see the new? Let me just only plot the highest order. Where's the, wait a minute, where's the third order one? If you want the best cubic polynomial approximation to a cubic polynomial, it is the cubic polynomial itself. So the approximation just replicates. Taylor's polynomial just replicates the x cubed plus 3x squared minus 4x plus 7 there. If we do anything but a polynomial, it won't be quite the same. Like here, I'll show you a different one. x plus sine squared x here. x plus sine squared x is this blue curve. So like the zeroth approximation is the green, then the best tangent line is there. And then you see the quadratic approximation in this color here, I guess. Where's my quadratic? I can't even see it. Oh, this guy. And then the best cubic, right? And so I, I think this is really neat, guys. If you want to, I don't know if you knew this or not, but if you wanted to approximate, say, like, um, you know, this x squared sine of x, if you made n go higher, like say 20, see what happens. Oh my goodness, <laughs> that's quite a lot to look at, isn't it? So let's just look at the highest order only. So check this out. By using a 20th order polynomial with appropriately chosen coefficients, you can pretty much tightly follow x squared sine x all the way from about a little shy of minus 1 all the way over to eh, 2.5 or something. Um, and this one's centered where? At 1. What happens if you move the center? Like what would happen if we move the center to say 0? Then the approximation that, well, then, then the polynomial will mimic the function, some sort of symmetric interval centered around zero, like that. So I don't know if you've, so you, you didn't really get this idea in calculus too, that we can use polynomials of higher and higher degree to approximate functions if you want. You, it was there, you don't remember, it was. I mean, if I'm being really honest, I just don't remember much of that class in Cal 2. That, that's it's an acceptable. This is, you know, this is an acceptable answer. We took it just because, like, it was a requirement. We had to take it, and it was almost taught, like, one of those courses as well. I see. Here, here, to I, get a credit. I got you. I spent most of that course teaching myself trig trigonometry. So. Oh. Mm -hmm. I tell you what, not, right, I tell you what, not knowing trigonometry and trying to do trig substitution is a bad place to be. Well, I mean, I got an A in the class, so I mean, yeah. I, I, but you. But you, you, learned, you learned a lot of trigonometry that semester, didn't you? Oh, yeah, I did. It's not a bad thing. And then I took it, and I was like, oh, this is easy. I had to teach myself this before. Mm -hmm. Here, here's a nicer one. This is sine. And if you just wanted to use, like, say you, say you just wanted to use the, uh, this is the approximation of sine by x. See this? You see this? So, like, sine tracks with x pretty well. How far? I can adjust the window here so it's a little bit tighter. So y you can see that like sine x, sine of x is equal to x pretty, pretty, pretty accurately until we get past what, maybe about here-ish, right? 
And so that's why in physics they use this approximation sine beta equals to theta. That's good for about plus or minus 20 degrees to within a percent. You can actually see that here. If you want to approximate sine more, like further, you have to add higher order terms. That's what the Taylor polynomial is. It's like, check this out. If I go to three, see how much further it goes? Now it's tracking with sine almost out to like plus or minus 90 degrees. If I wanted to go further out, I could use a higher order polynomial. See, if I get to 10th order polynomial, I track with sine like a whole cycle to within the, you know, if I go to 20th order, it's just tight on the function all the way in the viewing window. And you'd have to increase the size of the viewing window to see like a departure from it. So anyway, I just, you know, I, I feel like as a community service here, I, I should take a minute or two to like talk about some calculus issues that you may or may not have like noticed. They, we don't, how can you test on what I'm saying, right? Like you could teach calculus too and not emphasize this and not be a bad calculus too professor. Like you might just be more focused on getting the students to understand how to do specific problems as opposed to gaining this understanding of like this is a tool that we can use Taylor polynomials to mimic functions if you want. Anyway, there it is. Check that. I mean, that, I, I just think that's really cool. You can recreate the sign using a 20th order polynomial out that far. And if you just keep going, right, and if instead of using polynomial, you use a series, which is an infinite sum, right, then you don't get just over a finite interval. You get over the whole real line because that's the Maclaurin series or the Taylor series for sign. Anyway, as you can see, look at this monstrosity. <laughs> Use <laughs> all the actual, the actual coefficients out to the order twenty. That's that's uh, not something I want to copy down by hand, but um, I don't know. Bill's funny. He he. I think he's actually sort of uh, eliminated some of the numerical um, power of these 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 interactions, so that his students can't do all of their homework with it. Like if. He, He's not careful. <laughs> They'll just do all their homework on these things. All right, anyway. So take your picture, move along. Oh, my goodness. Model the cone using AR geometry. All right, we're, we're going to come back to four, all right? <laughs> I, I actually have a printout in the math department i got to go grab. That's why I'm coming back to it. And also, I have the camera on right now, so I wanted to start down the derivation I was talking about. So, now th this is really more high school math topic that I have a suspicion you guys might not have seen in your coursework. Because I know personally, um, Personally, I think it got left out of mine. Um, so let me just see if I can just start down the path of one of these derivations here. So my question to you is, what is an ellipse? Do you guys know? What, what's the geometric definition of an ellipse? Some people, I used to, used to say locus of points, right? Collection of points, such that what? Collection of points for which the sum of the distances to two <laughs> focal points is held fixed. So if we put those focal points on the x-axis, it's kind of like the most sort of easy way to um, see the formulas. So like here, I'll put one of the focal points at C0, and I'll put the other one over here 
at minus C0. I'm going to take C to be positive, all right? And then if I, see what I should have done, I should have gone to the dollar store and I should have bought one of those toy, and arrow, those toy boy and arrows with the suction cups. And then I could have like, this is what you should do if you have a class, right? Obviously, you should get the bow and arrow. You got to bring it to class. You got to find the miscreant in your class to make them shoot the bow and arrow onto the board. And another one somewhere else, get string. That way, you get, that gives you your two focal points. And then if you just hold the string around those two things, that fixes the, the sum of the distances. It's how long the string is because the distance between the string, the distance of the string between the focal points, right? If I hold the string around these two points, like in a loop, and I keep the, point, the string taut between those two points and just connect the other point, then the sum of those distances is going to be held fixed as the string moves around. Sorry, I didn't get a string and suction cup darts, but I forgot until I got here today. My bad. Um, no, it's it's because uh, of COVID. <laughs> Sorry. I think maybe I may have finally found something you can't blame on COVID, right? It's, it's too much of a stretch. Oh, it's just it's just a sparsity of local resources problem. I'll I'll, I'll accept it. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to erase the uh, jibber jabber up here at the top for the sake of it not serving any purpose. All right, so um, so then what we want to do is I want to I want to show you because you guys tell me what was an ellipse in your algebra class. When I first learned what an ellipse was, to me, an ellipse was this. That, to me, was an ellipse. Right? It's this. They have not, you guys, the, the, okay. what? As a tutor, okay. I have not come across What? Listen. Okay. Junior year took pre-calc. Senior year took AP calculus. Freshman year here took pre-cal with trigonometry. Uh-huh. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you. I mean, that is helpful to me as I'm talking about ellipses in my pre-calculus class here. I mean, I think it's in the, it's in the syllabus, I thought. Anyway, um, so just so you know, um, there's something called a conic section. So if you have, and that's a cone. Actually, they mean a double cone. But if you think about passing a plane through a conic through a double cone it either is going to like kind of cut the surface of it so you get like a line you can have a horizontal plane cut through just get a point lines and points are examples of quote unquote degenerate conics but if you have oh man like that use your imagination yeah that would be either if you cut it horizontal it's a circle. If it's tilted a little bit, that gives you an ellipse. Um, and then the other thing that could happen is you could have something more like, let's see. Oh, man. So sad. Such a sad, sad situation. Um, something like that. Hmm. Oh, man. Ah, oh, yeah, there we go. So um, if I could do it right, it would be, you know, you can get parabolas like that. If you have a plane which cuts it like this, you know, you could get like, I, I'm not doing it justice, but you can get a hyperbola the other way. So ellipses, parabolas, hyperbolas, 
um, circles, these are all examples of what are called conic sections because these are curves which can be obtained by sectioning a, con, a cone, rather. Section, just another word for cut, conic sections. But ellipse, in every last one of those, you can define using distances. So an ellipse is the collection of points such that the sum of the distances between two focal points is held constant. And um, a hyperbola is a collection of points such that the difference between the distance between two focal points is held constant. So instead of being the sum of the distance, it's the difference of the distances. Um, <clears throat> hyperbola, instead of having a plus here, you get a minus. All right. But, you know, just to... Um, Maybe this one will work. Um, <clears throat> maybe not. All right, so this is my ellipse, right? I just want to kind of give you a flavor for what's involved here. If this point is x comma y, right, then this would be, let's say, distance d1, and this would be distance d2, right? <clears throat> And we could label some other special points for the sake of um, conversation. Like this one, if we want to make it link up to that formula, think about what happens when you put y equal to 0. y equal to 0 puts you at this point or that point, right? So put y equal to 0 here, you get x squared. You get x squared equals to a squared, right? x is equal to plus or minus a. So we, we should, to, to make these equations consistent, to match up with the other um, way of thinking about ellipse, we should really label this a0 and minus a0. Although, I mean, technically, I'm, I'm really showing you a derivation of that formula from more basic geometric principles, namely that the sum of the distance is held, held fixed, right? So anyway, let that point be a0. Let that point be minus a0, right? They have to be symmetric because of the, think about the distance formulation. So here we go. What's the, what's the formula for d1? We got what? We got square root of x minus c quantity squared, right? Plus y minus 0 squared, which is that. And then what's d2? So we got x plus c and plus y squared, yeah? That's equal to d1 plus d2. Can you tell me what um, d1 plus d2 should be in terms of a? Yeah, I mean, look at it here. What happens when we take that point and slide it down here? So I guess my question is, what is what is d1 and what is d2 when we make x comma y equal to a comma 0? All right, so I'll, I'll do the easy part. d1 should be a minus c, right? How about D2? A, yeah, A plus C. Very good. So what's D1 plus D2? Zero. Two A, right. And that constant is fixed all the way around the ellipse, even though it's governed just by that one point. We could have just as well have fixed the value of d1 plus by d2 by like looking at that point, for example, right? Um, we could also, it might be helpful before we go anymore, what, what, what happens if we go at like the top, top point there? Oh man, all I got is red. I thought I had a green in here. Oh, I got them down here. <laughs> Idiot. Ah! <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. Ah! So 
So this should be 0b if we want to make it match that, right? And this should be minus 0 minus b if we want to make it match the other formula. How should b and how should the b be related to a and c? See this triangle here? You remember from calculus too. Right? <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Actually, I'm just kidding. We knew you've known right triangle trigonometry stuff from much much earlier, right? But this is C, this is B, and um, well, okay. Um, yeah. Curses. There's something I can say about that. But anyway, let me. I don't want to go through the full derivation in here because it'll take me a while. But um, there is a relation between A, B, and C. We'll, we'll get to it here in just a second. But I mean, you look at the, this equation is what is naturally suggested by the, the geometric definition of ellipse that the sum of the distances is held fixed, right? But does this look anything like the thing we show students in algebra classes in other locales? Um, I, there, there must exist somewhere. Somewhere in Alabama, there's a high school teacher <laughs> teaching students this. <laughs> I believe in my heart. Or maybe it's a, maybe it's a Mississippi thing. I don't know. I, uh, <laughs> what's that? They do it in Mississippi. They do it in Texas. I remember doing that my sophomore Okay, good, good. I, I, it's not. It shouldn't be uncommon. So how? But look at this equ like this equation versus that equation. How are those the same stupid thing? Right. I mean, that equation's nice to work with. This equation's a bear. So what you do, square it. Isolate a radical and square it. Square that, what do we get? x minus c squared plus y squared equals to 4a squared minus 4a square root. Like that, right? And it's anything, let me go a little bit further here, that gives me what? x squared minus 2xc plus c squared plus y squared equals to my, uh, 4a squared minus 4a times the square root of that stuff plus y squared. And then over here, plus uh, x squared plus 2xc, plus c squared, plus y squared. Did anything cancel? Some things cancel, right? See that? This guy, that guy cancel. Um, this and that cancel. Thankfully, this and that cancel, right? But we are left with that guy and that guy. And isolate the radical. So we get... Um, minus 4xc uh, minus 4a squared. Is that everything? Yep. Divide by minus 4a. So that's equal to um, xc over a um, plus a. A? Right? And that's equal to the square root of x plus c squared plus y squared. And then what do we do? Square again. And so then we get x squared c squared over a squared plus 2xc, the a's cancel, plus a squared equals to x plus c squared plus y squared which of course is x squared plus 2xc plus c squared plus y squared. Hey, check that out. These guys, gone. And what are we left with? Put everything together. We've got x squared times c squared over a squared 
minus 1. Uh, oh, man. Let me, poor choice, poor choices. I should have done 1 minus, 1 minus c squared over a squared. And then plus y squared equals to what? a squared minus c squared. I think I got everything. Let me count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, yeah. And then one more step. We've got um, x squared over um, Grief. I can't, ah. Let's see here. So I have x squared times 1 minus c squared over a squared, all divided by a squared minus c squared, right? Plus y squared times 1 over a squared minus c squared equals to 1. And um, my claim is that if we could see clearly, we should find an argument. Well, does this simplify? I think if we multiply that by a squared over a squared, something magical happens. What happens if you multiply that by a squared over a squared? See that it's going to give you an a squared minus c squared in the numerator? And it, 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 it yeah, it snap indeed. So that's x squared over a squared. And if we could see clearly the picture earlier, we could find an argument that would show us that that has to be b squared. But I think this is something a lot of people haven't seen. There's a corresponding derivation for the equation of a hyperbola. And also for parabola, it's the collection of points which are equal distance from a line and a focal point. Now, so uh, I said derive the formulas for conic sections. Instructor will give you a little talk to get started. You can take a photo of the derivation and post it here. So I think you have a derivation to take a <laughs> photo of now if I get out of the way. It's here. Um, actually, we, if I can get that to go away, right? How do I make that go away? That doesn't help, does it? I need something blank, like very boring. Let's see if I can. I'm, I'm working on it, guys. I'm trying to. Where's the? Come on. Oh man. I'm trying to just like read mode. How does that? Is it? How can I make all this other stuff go away and just look at like the blank paper page? Do you guys know? Oh, it's a big mutton called read mode. There we go. That's about as clean as I can get the board for you. Oh, this stuff down here I can't fix though. Uh, I mean, this other one I fixed is fine. Oh, okay. And I'm at an angle board like that. <laughs> By the way, there, there's the derivation for you. Now, um, I wanted to show you what's involved, at least in one case, the work, to, um, the work to derive the formula. So first of all, you could also consider an ellipse where the focal points were like on the vertical axis. That would be very similar with x and y kind of change roles. 
But you can also think about ellipses that have focal points on like not a horizontal or vertical axis, right? And there, the formulas are not going to, you're not going to find them in most algebra courses, period. And I think I showed you guys this stuff before, right? We were playing with Desmos. We looked at the, uh, remember, we, we animated through different choices of parameters for a um, conic section. Didn't we do that? I think I've talked about these before in here a little bit, like early on. All right, so let's look at that PowerPoint that I mentioned. Yeah? And then I will go over, we will take a short break as I go over to um, grab the, uh, the cone handout for you guys. Where did I put my, I think it's in content, right? There's a couple things. Um, actually, let me look at the boring thing first. I haven't really asked you guys a question about this, but this is a uh, PDF I wrote about how to find parametric equations for um, for curves. And um, I ju it just so happens in this that I, I spend a fair amount of time on some of the uh, same mathematics we were just talking about. So I gave you a copy of it just in case. This doesn't have like full derivations. This um, PDF I'm about to look at here with you, but what this does have, in case you're interested in, it does have a collection of like formulas that maybe you're not aware of, and um, hey, look at this, A. Hey. <laughs> there you go. Um, anyway, uh, so in here, let's see here. Eventually, I get to the stuff. So here's a here's a. If I can make this bigger, just bear with me here for a second. I'll eventually figure out how to get this thing out of here and look at it properly. Miserable. Uh, no, no, no. I don't want to look at it in your stupid Google viewer. I would like to look at it with Adobe. Thank you very much. I would like to look at it with... Come on. Full screen mode. There we go. So here's a, a better picture of what I was, oh, come on. Why won't it let me make it bigger? Oh, it will. There we go. So here, guys, um, you know, here's a, by the way, this is created inside the LaTeX. So I, I can share with you guys, if you're interested, the, the, the LaTeX source for this document. There's actually code which draws this picture using something called Tixie. There's a package which will make uh, graphics inside LaTeX. It, it does require a certain amount of um, effort. But on the other hand, there are like uh, Stack Exchange websites that are devoted to discussing how to create Tixie pictures. And there's hundreds and hundreds of examples that people will share freely. So you can cut and paste stuff like I did here into the document. Anyway, so generically, Generically, like algebraically, a conic section is some kind of solution of an equation like this, ax squared plus bx plus cy squared plus dx plus ex plus f equal to zero. Um, when the conic section has like a nice symmetry property with respect to the x or y axis, these cross terms like bxy go away. And when it's not shifted, these guys go away. And then you're just left back with like the ellipse equation we saw. But down here, is just like just like some you know like uh, here's just a quick collection of facts like this is a short ellipse quote unquote short ellipse the, the relation between C A and B where the focal points are so I don't know you might you might find it interesting you might not here's a tall ellipse um, we actually worked through the geometric derivation. Um, I show how to parameterize it in terms of sine and cosine, right? 
Um, and then finally, here's a hyperbola, right? Which x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared, that's a horizontal hyperbola. And um, so if you've never seen this stuff before and you're interested, here's like just a quick write-up of it. There are good books that have, you know, see, my, my friend covers this in calculus too because I think he believes that like you guys have experienced, you didn't see it in your algebra course. But it's something we think any good math major should be aware of. It's a classic topic, you know. Um, all right. I'll put this silly PDF away. Let's, let's look at his uh, PowerPoint. I didn't actually ask you guys to do anything with that, uh, that PDF, did I? No. Nope. Now, part of the reason, um, besides the fact that I, you know, feel an obligation to try to share with you mathematics, I think might have slipped through the cracks. Um, the larger technology aspect of this exercise I want to draw your attention to is the idea of making animations with PowerPoints, because that's what this illustrates, right? So that's something you might want to do that might make a good fit for one of the future projects. Like if you're like, I'm kind of bored with Desmos. I want to, and I want to illustrate, and I want to illustrate translations of graphs using animations in PowerPoint instead of Desmos, or using Desmos inside PowerPoint or something. Like I am completely sympathetic to those kinds of, you know. There is no box. <laughs> All right. Um, but this is something um, Dr. Sprano, uh, Tim Sprano of Liberty University made, and he shared with me. And um, th I think this is something he shows in his Calculus 2 class. So let's just kind of like appreciate what it is. So a parabola is defined to be the set of points in a plane whose distance from a fixed point the focus is the same as the perpendicular distance to a fixed line, the directrix. So here's his focus. I think this is, this illustrates really good use of PowerPoint for mathematical presentation, the way he does things in here, right? He's just revealing just enough information to draw the student's attention to like what matters and then kind of like scaffolding it, like laying it on top um, as it matters. And now, <laughs> Uh, you know, you do the best you can. <laughs> I don't see that. Check this out. <laughs> All right, you guys, you guys got to watch this, right? <laughs> watch. Whoop. Whoop. What? what? Oh, wow. Ooh, fancy. One of the, okay, yep. Yeah, move. All right. Okay. Yep. Yeah, uh, what? What's going on here? Oh, okay. Same distance. That distance. And this one, match up. So if you, if you focus on his little, <laughs> Tim obviously had too much time on his hands. Um. <laughs> Ooh. Hey, look at that. It's starting to, <laughs> you just never know where he's going to go next, you know? Oh, well, there you go. Um, and so, you know, I think part of the beauty of this PowerPoint presentation is he has not let perfect be the enemy of good. Are there imperfections in this slide? I mean, yes. Does it matter? No, because he's getting the point across, but he didn't spend an inordinate amount of time making it either. I mean, he spent some time, but, <laughs> but you, you know, you see what I'm saying? I mean, there, at least I have a temptation to like spend the lion's share of my time on the thing the students actually don't care about, you know. Consider a parabola that opens up. So here's a picture, vertex of the origin. The equation is this, right? Well, we know that. Y not squared indicates the parabola opens upward. All right. In this case, the focus is 0p. There it is. The line perpendicular to the directrix is the axis. 
symmetry. Vertex is the point midway between the focus and the directrix. I mean, honestly, when I'm talking to calculus students, I rarely, rarely ever talk about a focus or a directrix for a parabola, right? Um, so I think what he's going to do here is he is going to now give formulas for the thing he, derived, he pictured before. See that? So that distance and that distance, they're equal, right? Y plus P is equal to that square root. Squares it. Cancel stuff out. What you got? You got Y is equal to 1 over 4 px squared. So that shows the relation between the A and the uh, focal point. Pretty simple. Ooh, whoa, fancy. And then he just makes it, uses a transformation, a graph idea to get the equation elsewhere, right? That's pretty cool. I'm going to skip ahead a bit here, guys. Oh, an example with numbers. Well, this is boring. Never show students examples with numbers. They might understand. Can't have that. That is, we don't want our students to actually understand what's going on. Well, if they understood, they could learn math well enough to become a math teacher and replace you. Our job security is only. <laughs> this system has failed us because there's only three of us in this classroom right now. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm kidding, of course. But for high school, open for math teachers. Uh huh. So now he's going through the same thing, but for like a horizontal parabola, right? Um, so th I mean, this PowerPoint would take, you know, I think at least an hour for the material we've gone through so far, right? To do it like carefully and slowly. And I mostly wanted to show you this because this is super cool. So here's his ellipse. There's the two points. So now he takes, he takes a stick, his sum of the distance stick down here. And then he just breaks it. <laughs> and uh, I think that's kind of cool. You could imagine making it, you could get, so think about this. Here's a cool craft you could do, right? Never said I didn't talk about manipulatives in here. You get spaghetti, right? Mm -hmm. Box of spaghetti. It all has the same size, and you just break it according to different lengths. And then if you, if you glue those, if you make sure you, you have to keep track of which ones are broken, but the ones that are broken, you can take those, glue them to common points. And as you glue them, they should like form an ellipse with the points that they get to. If the stacking, though, I don't know, the stacking might get kind of fussy. The whole thing. <laughs> what? It's 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 spaghetti and glue. What could go wrong? Um, just throw glitter in there too. Like, like, <laughs> throw some glitter. More of a mess. Yeah, nothing. I don't know. I was very impressed with this when I first saw it. I'm like, that's really cool, Tim. Like, I, this is, that's a very nice way of visualizing the sum of distances being held constant, you know, like just breaking a stick like that. That's, that's cool. Um, let's see here. I mean, but he also has the algebra that we went through, but he does it a slightly different way in gory, gory detail. The, now, what makes his derivation harder is he has not stopped to implement that the sum of the distance is 2a at the start. So he just calls it like d or something. And then the very, at the very end, he takes advantage of the special relationship that that sum of the distances has with that coefficient. <laughs> so you can make derivations more complicated if you want. That's also a good way to confuse the students and keep your job security. So. Woo. Whoa, I kind of got dizzy on that one. Um, let's see here. No, I just, all right, so anyway, he, let me fast forward a bit here. Hyperbola, 
define to set a distance that points into the plane, the distance between two fixed points differ by a constant, right? So I was like, how are you going to illustrate difference of distances being held constant? So here's how he's going to do it. Let's see. Are you ready? Blue line, red line. So does that make sense? The blue line is the difference. So a little red line and long, the longer minus the littler is the always fixed to be blue. It's like, oh, hey, that's cool. And so you can see how that starts to create. I think at this point he was tired of making this thing. Um, so. I tell you, I, I, I mean, I, I have, again, this is not mine. This is Dr. Mm -hmm. Timothy Spranos of, of Liberty University um, who kindly shared this with me. And I, I think it's very cool. I was just thinking that way too. Like, if you're tired of making it, I'm like, oh, I can't. Like, if you put in that much effort, you gotta just you're right. go through you, it. You gotta, you gotta find the time. <laughs> that was my level of, I was like, I just want to get it over with. That's why I don't overexert at the beginning if I know I can't keep it up by the end. Well, it was like a week long process. So, like, I, day one, I was like, oh, yeah, this is going to be great. And then, like, the next day, I was like, that's okay. And by the end, you're like, ah. Oh. <laughs> this is why the Calculus 3 section of every calculus textbook is not as good. By the time they get to that part of the book, they're just like, uh, I committed to it. I've got to do it. <laughs> you know? That makes me so well. <laughs> but um, so now you have an example of how you can create animations, mathematical animations, if you want, in PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, there, there, of course, are many other ways to, you can embed videos and junk in PowerPoint, right? I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. Yeah. I, uh, we, we could talk about it all day, but. Um, I used to think in middle school. Uh, no other well, I, I remember um, we had a uh, we had a uh, sort of undergraduate research symposium thing where I used to work, and uh, so in mathematics you won't probably find PowerPoint presentations if you go to a professional conference. Like people are going to use LaTeX; they're they're going to use something called LaTeX Beamer. It makes very professional looking presentations. Um, and it's also, um, it just fits, it weaves together nicely with LaTeX formulas, which you've already written for your papers. So why would you go and uglify them with Word, you know, um, if you're a mathematician? So we use Beamer. And um, so when I went to tell the organizer that we were use, you know, I had students that want to give a talk about the undergraduate research they did, he's like, oh, so can they send the PowerPoint? And I'm like, no. They can't. They're not using PowerPoint. And it confused them. They couldn't wrap their mind around the idea that people were going to give talks not in PowerPoint. I had to, I like, I had to threaten to, like, we're just going to walk away from it. We don't need to give talks. <laughs> we're not going to make PowerPoint. So this is a fight I continue to have with, like, the, uh, you know, IT people. Like, no, we're not going to make PowerPoint presentations. My students are not going to be involved in your whatever if they have to make PowerPoint presentations, they will do LaTeX Beamer because they're math students and that's what's accepted in our field. You know? Now, you, you, you guys are going to teach in high school, so like, I'm not suggesting you, like, I have to do LaTeX Beamer for my high school math teaching. Like, that's not what I'm saying, obviously, right? But uh, you, you should use what's most natural. So if PowerPoint is, is effortless to you, then use it. You know? But if you know the power is out, have 50% of the time in your school, maybe Maybe just maybe you should consider using a board all the I time. Mean, I actually like when I was in high school, we rarely had a PowerPoint mm -hmm. or any kind of actual presentation. It was more just on a whiteboard, or it was like mm -hmm. yeah, I cannot remember the name of it. But oh, the smart board maybe, or the uh, the president, yeah. the um. Like you write here and it's on clear sheet. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Um, projector. The projector. Yeah, like it projects.